It's time for the Splash Live from Civic Center TV, featuring stories from and about people like you in the greater West Bloomfield area. Simulcast on cable, 89.3 Lakes FM, social media, and the web. Now live from Green Media Center on Walnut Lake Road, it's the Splash Live! Live, local, social, it's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Thank you so much for being here. I am your host for today, Kevin McIntosh. Starting off with our top story, talking about in West Bloomfield, a changing of the guard continues amongst top leaders in our community as creating opportunities for new minds and new ideas are being grasped right here with the intentions of brighter futures. And Civic Center, Civic Center TV's very own Tyler Keefe has a story. When somebody sees a need in their community, they're often prompted to speak up. For others, they'll turn that talk into action and ultimately into service. In Greater West Bloomfield, most leaders are also your neighbors, family, and even your friends. Longtime resident Rosemary Reed believes quality leadership comes from a desire to help your community, especially in an age where polarized politics often keeps people on the sidelines. I think these days is probably more important than ever because people are, are repelled from politics for all the wrong reasons. When I come up to City Hall, I like to see the representation. I like to see the inclusivity. I like to see that things are moving forward. The winds of change are afoot at West Bloomfield Town Hall with the retirement of longtime township trustee Howard Rosenberg and the new tenure of leadership on its way for Vincent Kirkwood. An honor he says was motivated by his desire to help his community and improve the place his family calls home. Your voice matters. Um, if you live in the township, um, you want to see it thrive. And it, the more you get involved, the more you're able to make that change. And I was able to do that uh, through Parks and Rec Commission. I was able to do, do that through the West Bloomfield Township Diversity Task Force. And now I'm able to do that as a trustee for West Bloomfield Township. As with the end of any era of leadership, there comes a lasting legacy. For our community's leadership new and old, the 16 years of service on the township board from Howard Rosenberg has left a lasting impact and provided a lesson in commitment to leadership for residents of the future. He um, shared his expertise with me and his knowledge. He was a huge mentor and was always an ear to listen and to explain things to me. He was a good common sense voice here on the board. And the fact that he was a good leader, he facilitated communications, he made argument with the other board members when it was necessary. But at the end, he was a good, solid, uh, considerate voice on the board, and I think that's what he'll be remembered for. The call to service is for everyone, with many ways to have your voice heard and make a lasting impact on Greater West Bloomfield. I would tell people who are interested in uh, getting into leadership, to talk to somebody, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to people that you trust and they'll give you good advice. Public service is teamwork and I've had the privilege of working with the best team anyone could ask for. Thank you again. Let's keep working to serve our community. One great thing about our community is that there's so many different ways to get involved, whether it's volunteering with a local community organization, joining one of our boards and commissions, or even someday running for office. You have so many different options to provide service and give back to your community. For more information on those opportunities, you can visit wbtownship.org. At West Bloomfield Town Hall, I'm Tyler Keeft, Civic Center TV. And thank you for that story, Tyler. It's also a major time of change for the West Bloomfield Police Department as Deputy Chief Dale Young prepares to take over as his role as chief in January of 2025. This will be following the retirement of longtime chief Michael Patton. So Chief Patton and I have worked closely over uh, the last few years and certainly extremely close over this past year. And so, uh, you know, he was giving me some uh, heads up on this as time was, uh, was getting closer to his announcement. So I felt like his uh, succession planning was really good. Um, I, I definitely felt like I was uh, getting prepared to, to take this next step in my career and to uh, lead the men and women of this uh, fine police department. 
And when the announcement was made in October, Chief Patton has some lasting words of advice for his successor, advice that perhaps we all can take to heart as we strive to do good in our West Bloomfield community. It's never about him. It's about what he does for other people. And I think if you say that to yourself often enough, it'll keep you in the proper frame of reference and what you do here, that we are in service to others. And I've always hoped to have been, and I, hope, I know that Dale will be also, that he'll model himself as a servant leader for everybody here, the police department and the community. It's very important. Um, so I'm very pleased about the appointment. You're appointing a very experienced, decent, ethical, hardworking, and hopefully wise police chief here in the beginning of the year. There are so many ways to get involved and make a lasting impact. Again, to get involved at this township level, visit wbtownship.org. And of course, you can stay tuned right here for even more information on volunteer and service opportunities in our greater West Bloomfield area. Younger people in our community are also taking on leadership roles, even those that put them in face-to-face decision-making. And our reporter, Jake Schaff, has more on the story. In school, the voices of the students are just as important as the voices of the teachers. And to help make sure that every single voice is heard, the student liaisons work hard to make their generation proud. Working closely with the West Bloomfield School District as well as Oakland Early College, the student liaisons serve as a voice for the student body and help make sure that everyone is satisfied and prepared for years to come. Well, it was an opportunity that was presented to me through my school student government, and having done that since freshman year, it was something that intrigued me. I asked my um, advisor about the opportunity. She said that it would be something that maybe I should try out for, and once I interviewed for it and I looked into the position, it's something that I genuinely love, giving back kind of to the community and talking about what we get to do at West Bloomfield and presenting that information to the board is such a valuable role to me, and I'm really excited to be doing it. I've always been involved in many clubs and I'm on the board of multiple clubs so I thought it would be a great opportunity to get to tell the board about what the clubs are doing and really show what OEC does to keep the students involved. It's great because I get to talk to other people in the school and ask them like what have you guys been doing, um, they send me pictures and it really just helps me get to know the other students and share the amazing things OEC does. How does it feel to be a big voice representing the student body? It's definitely a lot um, to handle. It's big shoes to fill, but um, I hope that I'm doing a good job and I just really want to be able to shed light on all the different activities that are going on at West Bloomfield because we got a lot of things that maybe aren't as talked about or that could be highlighted more and I just really like to prioritize those things when I'm giving my presentation. What are some of the biggest qualities you've taken away from your role? I think the biggest thing is communication, which I think that's kind of cliche, but I think communication is integral to any type of situation, especially in work, and having those communication skills, especially between the different advisors of clubs and the students that are in those clubs, and then all the way to the administration and getting that information along has been a really valuable skill for me. Do you think this is going to set you up really nicely for when you eventually make the jump to college? Yes, I think especially at OEC where we are taking college classes at the same time as high school classes, not only are we able to kind of tell like what the college workload is, but we're um, set up to manage our time and become more responsible, which a lot of people struggle with right when they enter college, but at OEC we kind of have a step to prepare us for that. What would you have to say to people who might be interested in trying out this position for themselves? Absolutely go for it. Um, it might sound boring at first, it did when I first looked into it, but genuinely it is one of the most fun, amazing things to be able to collaborate with so many people in the community and to have this experience every month at the board. It's such a great professional opportunity as well as a learning opportunity for anyone who's interested. It's amazing to hear about the work that these liaisons do to further their education and to help the education of the entire student body. And by serving as a powerful voice now, that's going to mean great things as they head off into the future. For Civic Center TV, I'm Jake Schaff. Thank you for that story, Jake. We love to highlight young leaders, young students in our community who are headed in the right direction and helping the young uh, students of our community also. We love to see that. A congratulations is in order, as a matter of fact, for our West Bloomfield youth. West Bloomfield High School musicians had a chance to shine amongst an elite ensemble. Three talented West Bloomfield High School band students recently performed with some of the area's top musical ensembles. High school junior player Jonathan Saigai participated in the Oakland University Honor Band 
uh, working alongside esteemed professor and composer Andrew Perkins. We also had sophomore tuba player Layla Sharif performed with the Detroit Civic Concert Band and Symphonic Band, directed by Kristen Blanchard and Damian Crutcher. And last but not least, high school junior Neil Kamuth shined as principal bassoonist with the Detroit Symphony Youth Orchestra, led by conductor Nazir McFadden. Congratulations to these students representing West Bloomfield High School in the West Bloomfield community with excellence. And you can see more of that on the Facebook page, West Bloomfield Schools, for more on that. We also want to congratulate Lakers volleyball team as they earn academic All-State honors. Big congratulations in order for the varsity volleyball team. The team has been named the 2024 Team Academic All-State, a prestigious honor recognizing their outstanding dedication both on and off the court. This achievement highlights the hard work and commitment it takes to excel as student athletes. Thank you again to everyone on the team for setting such an incredible example to our community. West Bloomfield is proud of you and way to go Lakers. You can see more of that like we said on the Facebook page at West Bloomfield Schools for more information regarding that. Continuously highlighting local West Bloomfield community, uh, community leaders who are doing great things. We also want to talk about a local uh, local musician or leader of music ministries in the greater West Bloomfield area who's leading the choir into a great place in New York to perform. So joining us right here live on the splash is director of music ministries for the Orchard Lake Community Church, Bruce Snyder. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Snyder. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So we have a lot to break down right here. First and foremost, I want to talk about this Carnegie Hall uh, uh, performance that you all be doing. What does it mean to you to even lead a group from Orchard Lake Community Church to perform at Carnegie Hall in New York City? Yeah, it's probably a once in a lifetime event, uh, especially for this choir. Um, some of them have ever have never even been to New York City. So this is going to be a, a spectacular event for them. Uh, we know the composer who is conducting this concert, and so uh, that makes it a little bit more friendly, a little bit more fun. Uh, and in fact, that he's joining us back at Orchard Lake at the end of the week to do a repeat performance with our choir in town. So it's it's a significant uh, it's a significant time of encouragement and uh, celebrating with this choir. Congratulations, first and foremost. So once in a lifetime opportunity like that, performing in New York from our little community of Greater West Bloomfield, we love that you are representing. Can you just talk about how this opportunity came about? How did you all get in a position to perform at Carnegie Hall and just talk about the preparation process before you get there? I knew that I was going to retire after the Christmas season, mm. uh, after almost 30 years at Orchard Lake. And because I know this composer uh, and some of his colleagues, uh, I had texted them and said, hey, would it be possible for you to help me celebrate it in December and come into town and uh, do some of the artistry that you do at the piano uh, and help help us celebrate these series of last events? Um, and, uh, and he said, well, you know, I'm performing this work in Carnegie the week before. Uh, and I said, oh, really? Do you think we could uh, bring some folks? Uh, and he said, sure, and uh, put us in touch with the festival host agency, and went, we went from there, and before you know it, we have 22 people mm. flying the city. Bring some folks indeed. 22 people in our lovely Orchard Lake Community Church. Oh, what a great deal. And that just speaks on relationships, too, that you've built throughout the years. And cats out of the bag now. Congratulations on your retirement coming up at the end of the year. Let's speak on that. But right here, joining us live on The Splash, we have Director of Music Ministries for Orchard Lake Community Church, Bruce Snyder, now talking about his retirement and upcoming performance at Carnegie Hall. So reflecting on 29 years of service, what are your most memorable moments or performances in your role of director of music ministries? You know, I always felt like uh, I, I had two callings in life. One was that I was a music educator. I taught in Bloomfield Hill schools for 35 years mm. um, and, and tried to do that with consistency and some excellence and 
rare, wonderful opportunities for students. Um, but I was also always involved in the local church. I believe that music is something to be celebrated. It is something that is a, a gift of God, and we should use it, uh, you know, in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And so I've almost 30 years, and in that time, we've done fully staged musicals. We've done classical works. We've done work with orchestras. We've helped support concert series. Um, uh, we did a Europe trip early in my tenure. We spent 16 days uh, in Europe with the choir performing and touring. Um, we've make, taken a couple of road trips lately to see big sacred musicals in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm. Um, and so all of those things are wonderful. But but I think that the two things that are most important is that it. I, I like to play in the sandbox with others. I like to make music with other people. I think that's the greatest pleasure. There you go. Uh, there you and go. then to do that and be able to express my faith and encourage other people in their faith has been, I think, a big blessing. Love that. I, I just hear the passion in your voice, Bruce, and, and how you, you love what you do, your commitment to not only just the church, but the schools also. Like, you've, you've spent decades at, at both contributing and, and, and giving your service and your skills, and we, we want to thank you for that also. And I want to talk about 29 years, very long time. Can you just talk about how the music program has evolved over those 29 years at Orchard Lake Community Church? You know, in some ways, it's, it's exactly the same. Hmm. Uh, because the, the music of the church, uh, of course, there are a whole new generations of things right. musically going on. <clears throat> but there's also great threads of music that has nurtured the spirit of the church for hundreds of years. And so we, you know, in some ways, we do the same thing that people have done for generations. Um, I, think, I think the thing that I've tried to bring to it is that I really believe that music in the church is a calling. I think it's the second most important thing to the preaching of God's word mm. uh, in the pulpit. I think after that, the way the, the, the worship community celebrates in music is the next important time. It's the time when we get to speak truth and put it on a musical melody line. So maybe you will remember it when you leave. Um, so I think, I think the evolution has been always pushing it more towards ministering through music and not really about performance as such. Nice, nice. And, and I can understand that, too. I mean, church usually keeps it traditional and, you know, in regards to its religion and thing, the way things have worked. And you might have some some small changes here and there to adapt to the times or how you speak to the people or relate to the people and things of that nature. But other than that, the basis and the foundation is essentially the same. So I, I like the way that you put that. With us right here live on The Splash, Director of Music Ministries for Orchard Lake Community Church, Bruce Snyder talking about his retirement at the end of the year and the choir's upcoming performance at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Oh, man, that sounds so good. Let's get, let's get back to that. What impact do you hope the performance at Carnegie Hall would not only have on the members of the choir, but maybe right here, the members of the community in Greater West Bloomfield? Well, I, you know, I, I think that the choir sings quite well. Um, <laughs> And, um, but I think that we uh, live in an island kind of thing, you know? Mm. And I think on a, on a world-class stage with 250 other singers, a professional orchestra, I think we'll encourage them that they're not alone, that there are other people doing this and are, and are doing it well and are doing it passionately um, and are doing it out of their love for God and the sense of community that music creates. Um, and then I think that may encourage our own congregation to value what it is that this volunteer choir brings to the services every Sunday. I right. think it might help their, their view of what we do. Yeah, a little bit more sense of pride, achievement, things of that nature. I can understand that 100%, and I like your thinking. I like your thinking <laughs> with that, Bruce. So can we just talk about... As you're stepping down, you're retiring at the end of this year, starting off fresh next year, do you have any advice or, or hopes that you have for the future of music ministry at Orchard Lake Community Church? I think that the leadership of the church is wrestling with what does the future look like for the church as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really healthy thing that they're doing that. Um, and now, um, with my stepping away, it's a perfect time for them to say, what do, how do we want music to represent 
what the future of the church is going to look like. And so I think it's a time of pretty deep study for them as they organize that. Uh, and then I, I just want the music to always be good, mm -hmm. uh, but I also want it to, to reflect the vision of the church, to, to be part and parcel with everything else that's going on in the ministries at Orchard Lake. Love that. Love that. Yeah, that, like we said, it's continuous evolution of the church and of the community. So they're going to take some things to kind of figure that out, and we appreciate it. Just a few more questions before we let you go, Mr. Snyder. One, I have to ask you this. What are you most proud of in your 29 years of service? Uh, I think I think it is that that God has been praised week in and week out when it was easy and when it wasn't easy and that God's people have been encouraged by the musical team that has wrapped itself around me uh, for these many years. Uh, it is it is a high calling and I think that I think we've represented that faithfully. Perfect, perfect. And if you don't mind me and our audience being just a little bit nosy, what are your plans after retirement going forward in the year 2025? My wife and I have a little condominium in Fort Myers, which has survived the last two hurricanes. Mm. Uh, I'm excited about that. Um, <laughs> and we're going to spend some R&R &R time, uh, really the first time that we will be completely retired. <clears throat> and we're going to spend some time there. Um, I've already made contact with a couple of community choirs uh, in Fort Myers, and I'm going to sing with them. Um, they're planning a big uh, mass concert in the spring for the Brahms Requiem. Okay. And, uh, and I'll be singing that with them in German. Um, and then there are a couple of churches that we're tangentially involved with down there. So we'll, we'll, we'll stay involved. And yep. then I don't know what happens in the May when we come back to Michigan. We'll see what comes from that. Yeah, you just kind of figure it out. But you can't run away from that passion. That's what I'm hearing, Bruce. You retire, but it's still going to be attached to you. I love that. <laughs> Music is what I do. It's it's the only thing I do. It's mm -hmm. how I communicate with the real world. I, uh, it's Yeah, it doesn't go away. That's a testament to it. Hey, I want to thank you so much again for your time. Congratulations on your retirement and the next chapter of your life. And good luck performing December 2nd at Carnegie Hall. Once again, Director of Music Ministries for Orchard Lake Community Church, Bruce Snyder. Thank you. Let me make a plug for Friday night, December 6th at 7 p.m. at Orchard Lake. If you can't fly to New York to see us there, come to Orchard Lake Community Church on Friday night, December 6th, uh, and we will do an, uh, another performance with orchestra, and the composer, Joel Rainey, will be our guest that evening, and we'll be at the piano. It'll be a wonderful evening. Oh, perfect. December 6th, Friday, make sure you support Orchard Lake Community Church Choir. Once again, Bruce Snyder, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you kindly. Great, great story about leadership in our greater West Bloomfield area and how it is getting our West Bloomfield community out to different places in the country, including New York City. So good luck to the Orchard Lake Community Church and Bruce Snyder and their uh, concert coming up, Carnegie Hall in New York City. There's a West Bloomfield High School girls basketball coach who has been named Michigan High School Coaches Association Girls Basketball Coach of the Year. Well-deserved, by the way. I just want to mention, under his leadership, our team has achieved three conference titles, three district championships, three regional championships, three quarterfinal appearances, two state semifinal appearances, one state runner-up finish, and two state championships. So joining us right here live on the splash, I'm honored to be talking to the head coach for the West Bloomfield Lakers girls varsity basketball team, Darren McAllister. Thank you for being here, sir. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. First and foremost, congratulations on being named Michigan High School Coaches Association Girls Basketball Coach of the Year. I just got to get it from you first and foremost. What does it feel or what does it mean to you personally and professionally to get this recognition? Um, to be honest with you, uh, I, um, well, I, I'm greatly honored. Um, I definitely appreciate it. But I guess for me, I'm constantly in go mode. Um, it's the beginning of the season, so that's where my mind's at. I guess when I'm when I'm done and I'm sitting back and I'm reflecting, that's when I can really have a greater appreciation. But to be honored by the Michigan High School Coaches Association, 
it's one of the top honors that, that I can possibly have, and I greatly appreciate it. That's real. And I can respect that response to essentially your soul trapped into the process and your system and, and, and continuously achieving great things. You're like, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. But we still got more work to do. There's still a journey to be taken. So I, I understand and respect that. The success of your leadership under your team over the past three years has been incredible. What has been the key to sustaining this level of excellence within the system that you create? Well, it all starts up top. I mean, we, we have a wonderful, wonderful superintendent who's very supportive of the program. Uh, she's one of our biggest fans. And then we have an excellent, excellent athletic director, Eric Pierce. Um, he gives us all the resources that we need to be successful. And then I'll go on record again saying I have the best coaching staff in the state of Michigan. And you tie all that together with some players to give you their desire, determination, and, and, and their desire to be great. I mean, what can you, what else can you get other than a couple of state championships in a running up? Yeah, yeah, I understand that. If you're watching on CivicCenterTV.com, you can see some of the B-roll that we played of uh, the West Bloomfield High School girls basketball team at the state championship at the Breslin Center, East Lansing. I was there. I witnessed that firsthand. It was a great experience. But then some of the all-stars, the Davis twins, who are key, during that championship. Now playing D1 basketball at Georgia, can you just talk about how it feels for them to be uh, excelling at the next level of basketball in their career? Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. I mean, when, when I, when I, you know, I'm a fan from afar, you know, watching the David Swins and the success that they're having, uh, watching Kendall Hendricks do her thing at Loyola, Chicago, mm -hmm. and then watching Destiny Washington do her thing from an academic perspective at Ohio State. You know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, that, that, that big father is just sitting back watching his children succeed. And, yeah, man. Well, man, it's a great film, Kevin. It really is. So kind of just piggybacking off of that real quick, how do you kind of use all of their success going on to the next level to encourage and motivate your current team? Well, the reality of it is I don't have to do a lot of that. I think they had an opportunity to see, and that's the great part about uh, um, having an organization that, like we have at West Bloomfield, from day one, um, we hit the ground running with a desire to win the state championship, and we've done it. And the players after that have watched the players before them go on to win. So um, it, it, it's it's not a lot on me. It's just sitting back observing and coming in the gym and putting in the work. Good point. Good point. Love that. And with us right here, live on the splash, join us from West Bloomfield High School Lakers girls varsity basketball head coach Darren McAllister talking about being named the Michigan High School Coaches Association Girls Basketball Coach of the Year. Well deserved, by the way. I want to speak on like your clearly your system that you're creating is creating all-stars on the court, but let's go to off the court. How are you ensuring that your players not only excel on the court, but grow as leaders and role models in the community off the court? Well, that goes back to the, the, the aforementioned people that I, that I mentioned, our athletic director, our superintendent, and our coach. And I'm, I'm blessed with having um, one of the assistant coaches as an assistant principal. So we're able to make sure that the kids are doing what they're supposed to do on and off the court, mainly in the classroom. I think I pride ourselves on is we have one of the top academic teams in the state of Michigan since we've been there. And uh, that starts with our coaching staff and athletic director. And then we try to do things in the community as far as community service. And I think that really bring out the, the community when we make that run and go to the Branson Center. So it all ties in together. But I will say, you know, that's not something that I just, you know, lucky and found. That mm -hmm. was something that I was taught when I was uh, coaching at Wayne State University under the great coach, Kerry Laura. There you go. There you go. Love that. Paying your respects also. But kind of let's go back to what you were saying. You and your assistant coaches making sure that your team and those girls get out there and do different types of community service. So they give back to the community. So in return, the community is giving back to the team. Talk about how important it is or the role that the Greater West Bloomfield community plays in supporting the girls' Lakers basketball program. Well, I, I tell you, Kevin, um, one of the things that we saw in year one um, playing at the Breslin Center and playing against Rockford in the state championship, uh, it was Orange that was filling up three quarters of that gym. Mm. And uh, we said at that time, you know, we're, we're not going to let that happen again. We're going to make sure that we have our fans out there and our supporters out there. Now, we did win, a, we ended up winning the state championship, but that was just um, fuel for the fire. And this past year, uh, we had the, 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 the mantra of big game hunting. And it was amazing to look in the stands and see people wearing camouflage that 
I never would have thought it would have touched. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's a great feeling. And it all comes back to just, just the community buying in for, for, for one, us giving it to the community and it the, and the reciprocates. Love that, man. And with us right here on the Splash, head coach of the West Bloomfield girls varsity basketball team, Darren McAllister, talking about being named Michigan High School Coaches Association Girls Basketball Coach of the Year and just talking about their team currently. Now, I, from your perspective, I just want to kind of pick your brain on this. How do you manage and balance the pressure of not only – I mean, you set the bar to win championships now, Coach. How are you balancing the pressure of winning these championships with the responsibility of making sure you still have these well-rounded student athletes? That's a great question, and I'll answer it like this. Um, it's no pressure. Um, pressure is that mom, a single mom, having to make ends meet when she don't really have any help. Pressure is that person being diagnosed with a sickness they can't do anything about and it's possibly going to cost, their li cost them their lives. That's pressure. Um, this is basketball. and But the, the key to it um, of not being able to have that pressure around me is just surrounding yourself with people that is going to help you accomplish your goal. And it starts with my assistant coaches, Talisha Washburn, Jamie Glenn, my athletic director, the superintendent. And also I like to mention my, my, my beautiful wife who's standing by my side all the time and gives me the opportunity to go out there and accomplish my dreams. There you go. There you go. That just, that just goes to show that it's a community. It's, it's, it's a wheelhouse of people that help support you, that also helps to support the team and the girls. We appreciate your time being here, Coach. I want to thank you again. Can you give us a little preview of what we can expect in the next season going forward? I absolutely will. I tell you this, you know, it's a lot of people that's counting us out, but those people that's counting us out can't count. I tell you this, um, you know, if people say we had talent. Absolutely, we had talent. And if you want a chicken salad, you better have some chicken. But people don't know we got some chickens over there. So we, we're, we're, we're in, the, we're in the kitchen. We cook it up, son. So just come on out there and check us out. You'll see. Coach hitting us with the analogies. I love it. I love it. Pure, pure entertainment. But hey, we appreciate your success and thank you again for your time. And once again, with us right here live on the Splash, head coach of the West Bloomfield Lakers girls varsity basketball team. Darren McAllister, we appreciate you for being here. I got you on the ticket list. We'll see you there. Absolutely. You know I will be there. Another opportunity to talk to great leaders in our community, leading our youthful girls into not only great athletes, but great students as well. So we are going to continue to highlight local students or local athletes making a difference for the greater West Bloomfield community. We are live, local, social. It's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We'll be right back with the Splash Live. Want to enjoy Civic Center TV on your social media? Find us on Instagram at Civic Center TV. Get notified when we upload one of our interviews, full episodes, and more. Thank you for watching and listening to Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Hi, I'm Lauren Azuri, the Park Naturally Supervisor for West Bloomfield Parks. Congratulations to you, Civic Center TV, for hitting 1 million views on YouTube. We really appreciate your partnership in spreading nature education in a creative way in our community. I'm Lauren Azuri, proud to be one in a million. Good nutrition can help make sure you have enough iron, calcium, and vitamin C in your body, which can make it harder for lead to enter your bloodstream. Help protect your family from the harmful effects of lead. Stories and memories from Orchard Lake, Civic Center TV, television that's close to home. And now, back to the Splash, live. Live, local, social, it's the Splash, live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Thank you so much for joining us, I'm your host, Kevin McIntosh. Now, there is a West Bloomfield MMA fighter who will face another MMA fighter by the name of Christian Rodriguez on January 11, 2025, during a UFC fight night at the UFC Apex in Las Vegas. This is very exciting 
because the fighter representing West Bloomfield is Austin Bashy. And joining us right here live on the splash is Austin Bashy, MMA fighter from West Bloomfield Township, Michigan. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Man, I love having you on here, Austin, man, representing and doing great things and now making your UFC debut. First and foremost, how does it feel to be making your UFC debut against a seasoned fighter like Christian Rodriguez? Feels real good. You know, uh, I've been working towards this my whole entire life to be in the UFC and be a UFC champion. I started training when I was eight years old, and uh, here we are 15 years later, finally in the UFC. Austin, you're still walking around with this undefeated record, by the way, in case people just don't know. That has not taken a loss. 13-0, three wins by knockout, five by submission, if I'm reading that correctly. With that being said, what's been your biggest motivation during your undefeated journey to this point in your career? Uh, you know, I've had this dream of mine since a young kid, and uh... I know the only way to achieve this dream is uh, by continuing to work hard each and every day. And, uh, yeah, that's what uh, got me here today. Austin, we got to be realistic, man. You are not only making your UFC debut, so bright lights, bigger crowds, bigger stadium. You're also doing this against an, an experienced UFC fighter and someone with what some people would call a slight physical advantage. So how are you preparing to face this fighter in this fight? Um, I've said it before, you know, uh, the, you go look at my fights I've had in the previous past. Uh, I fought some tough, tough people and uh, people with a lot of experience, but that was my whole thing, fighting uh, tough guys. So that way when I am in the UFC and get matched up with people like this guy I'm about to fight, I'm ready for it all. Mm -hmm. Yes, man. Either way it go, we are ready to see you kick butt in that ring. And with us right here, live on the splash, MMA fighter, that's mixed martial artist fighter from West Bloomfield Township, making his UFC debut in January 2025, Austin Bashy, just talking about and breaking down his fight with Christian Rodriguez coming up. Now, from what I've seen, what I've read, my research, Submission, your submission game has been a key part of your success so far. Do you pretty much see your submission being a key strategy in your fight against Christian Rodriguez? Oh, you know, for me, it's all about, like, mixing it all up, you know, striking, mm -hmm. grappling, and then uh, the way uh, reason I do get these submission victories, though, is because usually at that second round, they're usually tired, and they usually open up for me, so taking them down and uh, them exposing their neck gives me the choke usually. First and foremost, I understand that. Like, any fighter, any athlete, if you're preparing for a game, a fight, a battle, you want to watch your opponent. You want to watch their previous fights, their previous games. So you don't want to hit them with the same thing they're probably already expecting, which is the submission. So I'm glad you answered it that way. Now, I want to I want to slide into another question I feel like is very important. You being from West Bloomfield, obviously we want to highlight that. But I want to talk about, as you are preparing for this big spotlight fight, how has the West Bloomfield community, friends and family, actually helped to support you and prepare you even mentally throughout your career to this point? Yeah, they've been uh, supporting me for a while here now. Usually, when I fought in Michigan, I uh, brought a lot, a lot of to those shows, and those same people are still supporting me, watching me, and even for my Contender Series fight that was in Las Vegas, I brought a Pretty uh, good crowd to Vegas with me, and uh, it will be the same come January. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we just want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the uh, Greater West Bloomfield Township and just the, the, the Greater West Bloomfield area in general, we're all here to support you, Austin. We're definitely looking forward to it. And we want to thank you again for your time. Lastly, before we let you go, do you have any message that you want to send to the fans, the MMA world, or anybody in general as we prepare for this fight in January of 2025? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you to everyone who continues to support me, those who supported me in the beginning, and uh, also, also those new fans who are supporting me now. I appreciate you guys all. You got a new fan in me, Austin, as well as the team here Thank at Civic you. Center TV. We appreciate it. Once again, mixed, mar mixed martial artists and making his UFC debut in January from West Bloomfield Township, Austin Bashy. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.
We want to wish him all the luck when it comes to his fight uh, coming up in January as he continues to uh, advance in his mixed martial artist career. Now, we all are noticing that temperatures are not getting any warmer. Cooler temperatures are actually in the forecast, meaning we are going to be turning up the heat in all of our homes, and we need to find a way to make sure we're staying safe. So, also heating up our homes, it could pose a serious hazard that could have some type of fire, uh, house fires, and also other different damages to our homes and properties in general. So, here to give us some tips on how to keep our homes safely warm this winter from the West Bloomfield Fire Department, we have Tim Tarak. Thank you for being here, Captain. Thanks for having me. Yes, we appreciate that. So kind of just going straight into it, can you just explain some of the biggest hazards that can come along with just heating up our home in the various ways during the winter and colder months? Well, one of the big ones we have, we already had it recently happen. Uh, <clears throat> when you fire up the furnace for the first time of the year, uh, quite often dust settles on the heating coil. And when that furnace first kicks on, that dust burns up and you get a smell of, of burning in your home. So be aware that the first couple times you fire up the, the furnace, you might have that smell that uh, is easy to mistake for a problem. And it's, it's quite normal. Just keep an eye on it. It should dissipate shortly after having it on. So that's probably the biggest one as far as the furnace goes. Yeah. Also, it's a good idea to have a, a licensed contractor come out and do a cleaning on your furnace uh, yeah. before, before that season comes. Uh, to, just to give it a once over and check everything's working and there's no cracks in the flue and whatnot. Hmm. Um, that's the big one, biggest one for furnace wise. Uh, there's a few other, you know, open flames, candles, you know, this time of year uh, with, uh, uh, you know, if you have your menorah going, uh, it's great to have, you know, they have LED candle versions of those now and, and for Christmas trees too, when you have those going, uh -huh. uh, make sure you have them watered and use LED lights because they cause less heat, all that kind of stuff. You brought up a good point with the candles. Didn't think about that. Yes, lighting the home with candles. A lot of people like to have seasonal candles during this time, so I can see yep. that also. But uh, having a contractor come out and look at your furnace, that's a new one. I haven't necessarily thought of that, but I'm glad we have that information from someone who's seen it all in many different situations. So we spoke on the furnace. I mean, there's many different ways that people can heat their homes in many different places. What are some of the biggest places in the home that can become hazards from your experience? Uh, well, uh, a big one is to, if you have space heaters, uh, not have combustibles around the space heaters. Um, and they should have a lot of the new ones have a, a feature where if you kick it or knock it over, uh, when it becomes no longer upright, uh, there's quite often a switch at the bottom that will kick, uh, it'll turn the unit off. Um, if you have an older one that doesn't have that, I recommend upgrading to one of the newer ones that I believe they're uh, standard on all of them now, uh, that if they get jostled, they get turned off because we've had fires before uh, start where somebody knocks it over into a pile of rags or uh, some papers because quite often people have them under their desk and uh, if they have a home office or even at a place of business and they'll kick it into uh, you know a, a waste paper basket and it causes mm. a small fire under there which can lead to bigger issues yeah yeah, exactly. It's just a, it's just a, a few different things to be aware of that, and that that we're highlighting right now. And with us right here, live on the splash, West Bloomfield Fire Department Fire Captain Tim Torok, just talking about safety in the homes as we prepare for those colder and winter months right here in the Greater West Bloomfield area. So we know that people are also cooking a lot more during these times, especially as we approach Thanksgiving and, and other holidays. You just talk about fire safety and and situations situations that are uh, uh, situated around cooking and the stove and things of that nature? Sure. So uh, everyone thinks fire put water on it, right? Uh, oh, yeah. I think uh, in recent years, uh, it's been it's gotten out pretty well that uh, for a cooking fire, especially a grease fire, water is, is the biggest thing you don't want to do because when water hits uh, superheated grease, the whole thing blows up into a giant fireball. And uh, you can go online and see dramatic videos of it at our open houses, which we just had last week or last month. I'm sorry for um, or earlier in the month for fire prevention week. We we used to do a demonstration where we show putting water on superheated grease on a stove outside. Uh, we have stove wired up that was uh, able to show that mm -hmm. and just a massive fireball. So yeah. never put water on a cooking fire. The the best way, the easiest one that you have right there with you in the kitchen probably is a cover for that pot. So 
the key is smother the fires. Don't put water on them. So mm. you have a grease fire if you're making your gravy for your turkey and you're heating up that grease and it flares up, cover that pot. There are also some commercially available things. Uh, one's called the Prepare to Hero. Uh, um, I've seen lots of videos online about that for, uh, for your grill or your kitchen. It's a fire blanket that smothers the that smothers the flame. So yeah, the key I've, the I've heard of those fires take away the oxygen, which extinguishes the fire. Instead, don't put water on it because that uh, is a, a giant mess. Seems like a great investment for the households uh, all around, especially with that being said. Keeping that right next or near the uh, stove or in the kitchen area for those types of situations. Thank you for yep. highlighting that. Cause yeah, cooking they're very, is... They come in a small package, and you can mm -hmm. get them on Amazon. Uh, that's The brand I, I've heard of is called Prepared Hero, and uh, they're a very nice product. There we go. There we go. Coming from the professional himself. We love to hear that. I want to pick your brain about something else that we don't necessarily talk about. We highlight smoke detectors all the time. Make sure you update them uh, at, at least every 10 years. Batteries, make sure they're working. Th test them out. What about carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide detectors? Are, are they a danger around this time? And can you just talk about how we could actually prepare for those also? Yeah, carbon monoxide isn't so much a seasonal thing, but it's an all the time thing. Um, okay. You know, some level of the carbon monoxide, uh, the levels we go by, it, it's measured in parts per million, which is a measurement of, of a lot of common uh, components of the air are measured in parts per million. So carbon monoxide is one that we can, we're around it all the time. We can be exposed to small amounts. Uh, up to nine parts per million is considered safe and normal. Mm. So uh, I just actually got two new uh, CO detectors for my home, CO being carbon monoxide, from Amazon because mine were 10 years old and at their end of life. The one thing is to watch that end of life and on the back of every detector, whether it be smoke or carbon monoxide, in the very small print, if you read that small print, uh, it'll say, you know, dispose of seven years out from uh, uh, first going in service or 10 years out, some are 10, some are seven, or some variation thereof. But to so watch those expiration dates. And also I recommend having a carbon monoxide detector that has a reading on it that gives you a parts per million now, it may not be 100% accurate, but at least it's a number to go by. Right. And then you can see it. You, it, it can beep. It, you know, they, they'll all uh, alert you audibly. Hmm. And if they give you a reading, too, you can kind of know what you're, you know, what amount it's picking up. Certainly call call us. We'll come check it out and see if there's, you know, a, a bigger issue. Uh, another thing to think about with CO detectors, if I have another minute, is the, for generators, right? For oh, this yes. time of year or any time of year when, you know, it's stormy and, and windy. If we lose power, generators are great. I have one in my home. Um, everyone knows to have them outside, certainly, because you've got to watch for that. Uh, um, uh, the exhaust mm -hmm. puts out carbon monoxide. So I had a call, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago where a gentleman did everything right. He had it outside of his home running in, in a storm, and he had a lot of CO in his house, and he his alarms were going off. Thankfully, he had alarms, yeah. and they called us, and I said, hey, this is weird. It's outside. And then I noticed a basement window near where he had the generator going. Uh, and it, the basement window was cracked with uh, letting in some air. He didn't think of it. And that was just happened to be near the exhaust. So when you place those carbon, uh, those generators, make look for open basement windows. Look for any points where air can get in the house because uh, if it can get in, it will. And it is a danger. Ooh, that was a great thank. Thank you for providing that that story and that example because that's one of those small things, like you said, you may not pay attention to, but yeah, it, it, it can lead up to danger. So generators as well, something that could be a danger to the home, but make sure you are taking your extra precautions there. With us right here live on the splash, talking about safety in and around the home as we prepare for those winter and cold months from the West Bloomfield Fire Department, Fire Captain Tim Torak. Just a couple more questions, real quick, Captain. Thing if you don't have, I mean, if you have the time, first and foremost, just very briefly, are there any other things in the in or around the home that could be flammable that people may not even know about? Mm, boy, uh, well, you know, over the years, everything we have is more flammable than it used to be. Mm. Uh, you know, our, our, the blanket that you have on your the blanket that you have at night just to be com comfortable and snuggle up by the on your couch is made of you know. Uh, um, polyester and flammable materials. So everything heats up faster than it used to. 
uh, the couch, couch is burned now. We, we call it legacy construction. In, in this business, we call it legacy construction versus modern construction. So the average home, there are videos online, and you can see those too, but there are videos online that show the, a cigarette dropped into a couch in 1972 takes five minutes to get a full living room going uh, in full flame. And that same cigarette dropped into today's couch with today's furnishings and today's draperies and today's uh, carpet can get that entire room in a raging inferno in two minutes. Ooh. So it's really crazy how just the components of your house um, are much more flammable than they used to be because things are cheaper and more readily produced. If they're uh, not cotton, you know, now they're all synthetics. So just keep any heating sources you have, keep those those combustibles give them a distance let everything breathe mm -hmm. uh let things air out if you smell a weird smell air things out and if you need to if you need to call us call us and we're, we're happy to come check things out we appreciate that lastly last question before we let you go just a couple quick things that we can do to prepare now for family emergencies uh you know it's great to have a, a plan um you know we stress whenever we have families come through or students come through on uh, on a tour Hey, go home and you know tell your parents check those check those detectors twice a year when you change your clocks, change your batteries, or at least check your batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, detectors or uh, smoke detectors and CO detectors are going with lithium batteries that have a ten-year life. So you're not really changing batteries so much, but it's certainly a good idea to keep an eye on those and check those dates. When were they purchased? When did they go in service? And are we at those expiration end of life dates? Yeah. And also. God forbid you have an issue in the home, let's plan where we're going to be so that if if you have a fire or a fire alarm and little Timmy runs to the backyard and Johnny goes to the street um, and the parents go to the street, we're not looking, hey, we're, we're missing one. Uh, so make sure all the kids, hey, hey, family, if we're going to have an issue, let's all meet in this place. Mm -hmm. so we know we're all here. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, you know, and then when we get there, we know quite often the front of the house is a great spot. So then we get the first thing we say, hey, is everybody out of the house? And then, you know, we can have a quick answer to that very important question. Hey, we appreciate all the information that you provide today. And we appreciate your time once again from West Bloomfield Fire Department, Fire Captain Tim Tarot. Thank you so much for your time and information, sir. Thanks for having me. Yes. Take care. Great information, great resources from our West Bloomfield Township Fire Department. For more information, visit them on Facebook, WB Fire Department on Facebook for more information. Now, the Cookie Walk, if you're not familiar, started in 1994 by the women of the West Bloomfield United Methodist Church, replacing their annual Christmas Bazaar, which ran uninterrupted until 2019, took a break from 2020 to 2022 because of COVID, and returned last year in 2023. So with us right here, live on the splash to give us more details and information regarding that event, we have pastor from the West Bloomfield United Methodist Church, Reverend Elizabeth Hurd. Thank you for being here, Reverend. Thank you so much for having me. We appreciate that first and foremost. Let's just start off with the details. What is the cookie walk and when is it? Just give out those details. Well, the cookie walk is exactly what it sounds like. It is a, a walk through our fellowship hall at the church with tons and tons of cookies that people can um, purchase and buy and have some treats for the holiday season. Uh, this year, it is gonna be on December 14th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Uh, at the West Bloomfield United Methodist Church. And we completely transform our fellowship hall into what is almost like a cookie wonderland. Perfect. All right, so this is a great uh, charitable event in some sort of way. So let's break this down. How do the proceeds from the Cookie Walk specifically benefit the women's group? And do you have any examples of projects that may, it may have benefited? Yes, yeah, so we uh, all the proceeds from the Cookie Walk go directly to our women's group at the church, and then they have a variety of projects that they support throughout the year. Um, recently, at the end of last school year, they helped to purchase a set of books um, for a fourth grade classroom at Chico, um, and uh, just to make sure that the teacher didn't have to pay out of pocket for the books. Um, they also provide our, our church office with gift cards every once in a while. So $25 gift cards to Meyer or Kroger 
so that when people call our church for financial support, we have at least a little something to give them. Mm -hmm. And then just a variety of other projects that they do. Um, we just recently, we uh, do Operation Christmas Child every single year and the women's group purchased materials and supplies and filled uh, just about a hundred shoe boxes with the help of the church. So wow. they do a lot of really great work um, wow. and that's what the money goes for, so. I love that. I love that, especially the fact that you're doing that and some of the proceeds, like you said, you're basically just giving those back out to the community, to those in need. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. essential foundation of a church. And I, and I love to see yes. that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from, from, from that perspective, I just want to talk about volunteers that you are uh, in, in need of with that event. What role do they play in organizing and running the event? Yeah, so it's completely volunteer organized and run mm -hmm. by volunteers within the church. And so we have two incredible women, Melody and Barb, who head it up every single year. And they just ask for volunteers from within the church to do things like make the cookies, um, run the cash register, run the way stations, um, make sure that cookies are on the table. And it really is kind of a all hands on deck event for the people in the, the church. But we are also very willing to have volunteers help out from outside the church. So, you know, if you want to make cookies or if you want to come and help us um, run a way station or run our cash register, we are more than happy to have you. Love um, that. But it's completely volunteer run. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. So anybody looking for volunteer hours or just looking to give a helping hand, there's <laughs> the opportunity right there. So just uh, looking ahead, do you, how, do you see any new opportunities or ideas for expanding the impact of the cookie walk or even the f fundraising efforts in general? Yeah, you know, I think that's that's a really great question. Um, like like you said, we did take a break from 2019 to 2022 because of COVID. And so we're kind of restarting this effort. And I think part of it is just kind of seeing where do we go in a post COVID world with the cookie walk and how mm. can we grow it and expand it? Um, Something I would love to see is more invitation for groups outside of the church to be involved in this and to try to make it a really great community event. Okay. Um, yeah, we we're we're growing and we're we're expanding and we're changing and you know this is our second year back after after a break with COVID. So we're we're looking for new opportunities all the time. And we love to utilize our platform here at Civic Center TV to help spread the word for our local organizations and groups to help pitch in for the Cookie Walk. And we appreciate your time again, Reverend Her, for being here talking about the Cookie Walk. Once again, that information and details regarding this event for people who may have missed it. Thank you so much. Um, yep, you can look at our Facebook page, West Bloomfield United Methodist Church. You can look at our website for more information. I think this graphic uh, that, that was just shown um, gives you all you need to know. There is an event, um, an event page as well for questions. And if you have any questions, you can call our church office, um, which I'm blanking on our phone number right now, <laughs> but you can, that, that information is on our website as well. So you can call our church office, you can email us um, and ask questions. So Absolutely. Thank you again so much for your time, your effort, and everything that you are doing that impacts and strengthens the West Bloomfield community. Once again, from the West Bloomfield United Methodist Church, Reverend Elizabeth Hurd. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, great things happening in greater West Bloomfield, especially as we approach the holiday season. It's great to find different ways to give back and make a difference in the community. So you want to find out more, go to their Facebook, West Bloomfield United Methodist Church on Facebook for more information regarding that. Speaking of local things happening in the community, you can celebrate the winter solstice with a glowing event hike on Thursday, December 19th, starting at 5 p.m. with the Recreation Activity Center. This self-guided half-mile lantern-lit trail offers family-free activities, including glowing crafts, marshmallow roasting, telescope viewing with the Oakland Astronomy Club, that's weather permitting also, and a glowing ice carving. So there's a lot going on. This is also going to be presented by Provision Living as well. For more information, visit the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks at WB Parks for more information. We'll continuously keep you updated with everything moving and grooving in our greater West Bloomfield community. Once again, I'm your host, Kevin McIntosh. Thank you for being here. And per usual, we are live, local, social. It's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM.